But today's revision lesson is going to be focusing on charge and current. In fact, we're going to be revising the whole of the specification points on this little subtopic. I'm going to be following the OCR Physics A specification. However, as always, the physics is applicable to all exam boards because the physics is the same. So let's get started. Now, first off, let's define what charge and current actually is. Now, what is charge? The great physicist Richard Feynman, actually in his famous lectures of physics, makes an excellent point that we cannot actually really define we cannot really understand exactly what charge is. All we can say is that it's a property of matter that causes it to experience an electrical force when it has been placed in an electric field. Now, if you're a first year physics student, you still will not be familiar with the concept of, uh, of an electric field, and that is totally fine. Because this is a revision lesson, I'm going to not be talking about that. Okay, now what do we actually need to know for the exam? First off, we need to know that current is the rate of flow of charge. Now, in physics, any time we're talking about the rate of something, we're actually dividing by delta t, the change in time. So the current is defined as the rate of change of charge. So this is change in charge divided by ch change in time. The current is going to be measured in amps, charge will be measured in coulombs, and time, of course, is measured in seconds. So the amp, you can also say that it's actually equivalent to coulombs per second, which you could also write as coulombs s to the power of minus one. If we rearrange this equation for charge, we uh, we can find an equation for the, the, the charge, uh, which will then be equal to the current multiplied by the time. So a coulomb, so let's have a look at the units of this equation. The coulomb, which is the unit for charge, will be equal to an amp multiplied by a second. Because coulomb, the unit of charge, amp, the unit of current, and seconds being the unit of time. It is important to note that charge is actually quantized. What does that actually mean? You all have heard about quantum mechanics, for instance, this branch of physics. Now, quanti a quantized quantity means that essentially it comes in tiny, indivisible, individual quantities. In the case of the electrical charge, we call this the elementary charge. The elementary charge is equal to approximately 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. The electron charge, for instance, is negative 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. Should I write this down? So the electron charge is minus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, where E is the, uh, the charge of an electron. Now the proton charge, on the other hand, will be equal to plus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, and both of those values are in coulombs. Now imagine that this was a really, really tiny sphere and we could actually see the individual electrons. In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have five individual electrons. Each of those electrons will be contributing 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. So that's one of them. That's another one, 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs, 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, etc., etc. Let's write this a couple more times, so minus 19 and 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. This would mean that the total charge on this charged sphere, let's call that Q, will be equal to 5 times the elementary charge, which is 5 times 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs, which is about equal to 8.0 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs.
We can actually uh, make an equation out of this, and this equation is that the total charge Q is equal to N times the elementary charge, where Q is the total charge, of course measured in coulombs, so that is our total charge, N will be the number of electrons, in this case, for instance, this was 5 up here, so, or let's be a little bit more general, let's call it the number of charge carriers, so the number of elementary charge carriers, it could be protons, uh, we'll have to be careful if uh, we're talking about ions, for instance, but let's just call them the number of charge carriers, or carriers of the elementary charge, and E is actually our elementary charge, which is, once again, 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. Now, as we said, current is the rate of flow of charge. The next part of the specification will be looking at current as the movement of electrons in conductors and the movement of ions in electrolytes. So in conductors, for instance, you could have a metal wire, our charge carriers tend to be free electrons within that conductor. They exert electrical forces on each other and they move along the wire causing a rate of flow of charge. Now the movement of ions is a little bit different. Imagine that we have the following simple circuit, which uh, is part of pretty much uh, most of the or any car probably, and uh, we have an electrical motor that is connected to a battery. The battery has a positive terminal and it also has a negative terminal. Now, inside of the electrolyte, if you're wondering what an electrolyte actually is, by the way, an electrolyte is just a fluid that can conduct electrical current. The movement of ions actually causes the current. So in this case, we'll just write down here on the side that the charge carriers in the electrolyte and the electrolyte are ions. There are two types of ions, positive and negative. So for instance, if they've lost an electron, or two, they might have turned positive. If uh, they've gained an electron or two, they might be negatively charged overall. Now, the positive and the negative terminal of the battery can cause a little bit of a misconception. When students see a question like that, the first instinct might be to think that the positive ion is attracted to a negative terminal and the negative ion is attracted to the positive terminal. Well, this is, this is a problem of almost of, of convention. So if you think about it, the positive terminal of the battery is a terminal through which positive charge will flow. So in this case, the positive ions are going to go to the positive terminal and the negative ions are going to go towards the negative terminal, causing a potential difference, which actually spins our motor. So a couple of couple of notes about the direction, which is really, really important. So the positive ions will go towards the positive terminal and the negative ions are going to go towards the negative terminal. Now here is something counterintuitive, which is just a convention that you guys need to be aware of. Let's say that we have a circuit, a really simple circuit. So we have a little cell and let's say that we connect it to a light bulb. So not a particularly tricky circuit. The, we're gonna have, the cell will have a positive terminal, we'll also have a negative terminal. Now the electron flow will be from negative to positive. So the actual electrons will be going this way, from negative to positive. Let's just label that. That's the electron flow. Now, in electronics, we use conventional current as the standard. And that is always, always, always defined as having the direction from positive to negative. So this over here is the direction of conventional current.
And I know that this is counterintuitive and uh, you can think of it as opposite to the electron flow. Please know that if your charge carrier is positive, for instance, there could be positive ions, then the direction of conventional current and electron flow are going to, uh, are going to match. Okay, now let's talk about Kirchhoff's first law next. This is a really important law in electronics. It says that the sum of the currents entering a junction equals the sum of the currents exiting a junction. I'm just going to highlight the word sum because this is really, really important. Okay, well, Kirchhoff's first law is actually a statement of conservation of charge. It simply tells us that the amount of currents going in somewhere will have to equal the amount of total amount of current going out of a junction because current is equal to the rate of flow of charge. By definition, it follows that Kirchhoff's first law is a statement of conservation of charge, which is a very typical exam question. Let's apply this to a little bit of a problem. For instance, we have five amps and we also have two amps going into this junction. A junction in an electrical circuit is normally represented as uh, just a little circle like this. So the total amount of current which is going in is going to be seven amps because I have five amps going here and then I also have two amps going down here. Now the total amount of current going out will have to equal to seven amps. So we have an unknown, so let's just call that X for instance, plus three amps. So we know that X will have to be equal to four amps because the sum of the currents entering a junction will have to equal the sum of the currents exiting a junction. Okay, now moving on to number density. What is actually number density? Number density is defined as the amount of charge carriers per unit volume. In other words, uh, if, we were, if we were to write an equation for it, N, which is our number density, will be equal to the amount of charge carriers. Let's call that capital N. So that's our amount of charge carriers. We're going to divide that by the volume. For instance, if I had a theoretical box with one meter by one meter by one meter. And let's say I had, I don't know, let's say I had three electrons over there. So let's just draw three electrons. Our number density N will be equal to our number of charge carriers, which is three divided by the volume, which is one. So our number density will just be equal to three. Now, what are the units of number density? Because the number of charge carriers, well, this is just a dimensionless number. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the power of 10, etc. It doesn't have dimensions, but the volume is measured in cubic meters. Our units for number density are going to be meters to a power of minus 3. Why is that? Once again, because volume is measured in meters cubed. So what we essentially do taking as the unit is 1 over meters cubed and 1 over meters cubed is actually equal to m to the power of minus 3. Anytime you see me using those brackets by the way it's just a way of identifying that I'm talking about the unit. Let's have a look at drift velocity next. Now what is drift velocity? It is defined as the average displacement per unit time of charge carriers along the conductor. For instance, um, if I had a wire, so let me just draw a simple wire and I have some electrons which are moving along here. This is normally a two mark question, by the way, in exam papers. The first bit is essentially just a definition of velocity. So it's just the average displacement per unit time. So we could just underline this, this will be our first mark. Now the second mark is very, very important. That indicates the direction of the drift velocity and that is along the conductor. Why is this important? Electrons um, can, can behave in uh, various different ways. They can also vibrate and they can move in all sorts of different directions, directions. For instance, they may be moving up a little bit or to the side a little bit. And the drift velocity is just the average displacement per unit time of charge carriers along the conductor. We tend to use the Nave equation to calculate the drift velocity. In this equation, I is the current. Let's just define this equation. 
n is our number density. A is our cross-sectional area. So let's just write CSA, the cross-sectional area of our conductor. So if this was a wire, for instance, it will be um, the cross-sectional area can be represented just over here. E is the elementary charge, so that's 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, assuming that our, that our charge carriers are electrons. And V in this case is the drift velocity. We could even give it a subscript uh, if we wish, but this over here is our drift velocity. Well, let's apply this equation to a little sample problem over here. We have a conductor with a cross-sectional area of 3.8 times 10 to the power of minus 6 meters squared, and we have the current. What we're looking for is the drift velocity of the electrons. We're also given the number density. Our first step will just be simply to rearrange for V. So V will be equal to I divided by NAE. We know that the current is equal to 0 0.03 amps, and then I'm going to divide by our number density, which will tend to be quite a large number. In this case, a very large number, so that's 5.0 times 10 to the 25. We need to be quite careful to just not to make a mistake while we're inputting this with any brackets in the calculator. Let's multiply that by the cross-sectional area, which is 3.8 times 10 to the power of minus 6 and finally we need to multiply by the elementary charge which is 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 let's extend that division sign and if we put that into a calculator what we're going to get is about 9.9 .9 times 10 to the power of minus 4 meters per second. Now this is actually quite a typical speed. The actual electrons themselves tend to move very very slowly however electricity seems to propagate almost instantaneously. The this property, the number density, is actually used to compare different materials in terms of their conductive properties. So conductors, for instance, have a very high number density. So this is really important to note. They have a very high number density. Should we just write N? Insulators, on the other hand, have a very low number density N. So they have very few uh, charges per unit volume, whereas the conductors have quite a lot of, or they have a lot of free charges per unit volume. Semiconductors, on the other hand, are, they have an in-between. So let's just write down in-between in terms of their number density. Okay, folks, well, this was all of the topic of charge and current based on the OCR Physics A specification. If there are any questions, do let me know. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you're enjoying those revision videos and you're finding them useful. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.